uh, welcome everybody to this next seminar in this uh, Sirad Kaust seminar series. Uh, today we have two um, French speakers. Uh, I know I was billed as being on, but it's actually much better what we realized when I was talking with Elodie about this, that Elodie gives a uh, seminar entirely in her own right and I can chair with full freedom to harass and pester the speakers. But we're going to start, in fact, um, uh, with Didier Basile uh, from, uh, from Sirad. Uh, Didier uh, actually is a, is, is a geography student. He has a PhD in rural geography uh, from Toulouse. And uh, he is uh, now uh, based in Montpellier. He's been in Montpellier for many years, but has also worked extraordinarily internationally. And I should say in that context that Didier speaks more languages, I think, than anybody I know. It's amazingly multilingual. And, um, and I've been with him in South America, for example, and he's fluent. It's very impressive. But uh, he's had experience in South America, Africa, Asia, and has been doing a lot on in situ conservation of biodiversity and uh, participatory, participatory plant breeding research. Um, his real, um, he, he, from my perspective, I perhaps shouldn't be doing this, but anyway, from my perspective, Didier really rocketed to, to my attention um, because he was the, um, as I understand it, the lead, um, or at least uh, the scientific lead for the International Year of Quinoa. So the FAO, the United Nations General Assembly, declared 2013 as the International Year of Quinoa, which is a pretty remarkable thing. And Didier uh, was uh, based in FAO and published a book about, uh, it's, a, it's a massive volume um, on the state of art on quinoa around the world in 2013. It's a very, very useful tome and a great contribution. Didier is incredibly well connected internationally and really is, I think, I could say the world centre um, for, um, for quinoa research. So it really is a great pleasure to be able to have the chance to collaborate with him and it's a great pleasure to introduce him now for this seminar. So with no further ado, the floor is yours, Didier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Oh, I will share my screen. Is it okay for you, Mark? Yes, that's beautiful. That's a Thank very you. nice photograph. <laughs> um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. First of all, I want to thank Mark and the organization at COAST for giving me this opportunity to meet you today. So I work at CIRA, the French Research Center and public institution focused on agricultural research for development. And CIRAD has the mandate to develop target research to contribute to development and poverty alleviation. But uh, the most important thing is that all our researches are built in partnership with stakeholders in developing countries. My peak will focus today on quinoa expansion behind its origin with a particular attention to quinoa adaptation and sustainable agriculture. Quinoa, known as a neglected and unrelated species, was considered a major crop in Latin America for centuries. As a consequence of the conquest by Spanish, cultivation and consumption of this crop were suppressed or only continued on the local scale. And the potential of quinoa was only rediscovered during the second half of the 20th century. And following the International Year of Quinoa, in 2013, the case of quinoa was highlighted on the basis of the role that quinoa's biodiversity and its high nutrition value can play in providing global food security. First, I will give you some background on quinoa, and second, I will analyze trends of quinoa expansion and discuss some limits. And third, I will present some examples of my research on quinoa. Canopodium, commonly known as the goose food genus, includes a wide array of species and is native to all the inhabitant continents. 
quinoa is cultivated primarily for its edible grains, but the plant has broad uses, like the consumption of young leaves and sometimes the tender panicles. It serves also as animal fodder in fridge or as silage, and additionally, it is used in medicine and cosmetic. Quinoa is a genomnosius allotetraploid and a facultative autogamous. And many cadopodium species are adapted to arid or salid environment. The genus Chelopodium is notorious for its invasive weeds, such as lamb squatter or pigweed, Chelopodium album and Chelopodium berlandieri. Although this and lastly two of the species of the genus were domesticated anciently in four continents as both vegetable and seed crops. Economically important species are quinoa, Chelopodium quinoa, used as a grain crop, Chelopodium pallidicaole, and Chelopodium berlandieri used for both grain and vegetable, and Chenopodium album, mainly used as a leafy vegetable and foliage crop, and some Imerian types are also cultivated for grain. But phylogenetic relationship between cultivated and their related white taxa have been studied on the basis of DNA structuration, but the genus complex needs further studies to solve some taxonomic problem. And I'm sure that Mark and Elodie will share us some last development on this topic. Quinoa was domesticated near Lake Titicaca between Peru and Bolivia. A generation of farmers have been involved in quinoa selection, which explains the high levels of genetic diversity found today. Quinoa diversity at continental scale has been associated with five main ecotypes from the island, Peru and Bolivia, the intermediate valleys in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, the southwest of salt lakes in Bolivia, Chile, and North Angela, the Yungas with humid tropical climate in Bolivia, and coastal or lowlands ecotypes in the central and southern part of Chile. Each of these ecotypes is associated with sub-centers of diversity that comes from the surrounding of the Lake Titicaca. Each one corresponds to specific conditions of altitude, latitude, soil, and climatic condition. Here, just some picture for visualizing the environment. Here is the quinoa from the Andean Valleys in Peru near Cusco. Here is quinoa from the Bolivian Altiplano. And here is the quinoa from the central region of Chile in the estuary of a river and growing on alluvium in salty water. Considering the variety of situations where quinoa can grow, we can observe a high, very high genetic diversity in situ associated to local culture, which maintain it through agricultural, culinary, and ritual practices. And the quinoa global expansion is very recent. The project American and European test of quinoa overseen by Henri Morica and Sven Ulrich Jacobson, together with Juan Izquierdo from Peru, from the FAO, was really the most important effort during the 90s for quinoa global spreads. <coughs> Field trials were established in several countries at global level. And then with the international years of quinoa in, in 2013, the FAO gave technical assistance to many countries outside the Andes for adapting the crops in new environments. Differences are very pronounced between ecotypes, and the central and southern part Chile ecotype from the lowlands is the more adapted to temperate environments. Here you can see two pictures with women from the Mapuche communities in the southern part of Chile cultivating and maintaining some quinoa runways in their home garden. The multiplication and the pride of experience station are directly linked to major international initiatives for research. And research partnerships are often facilitated in the exchanges of germplasts 
and have a powerful impact on this development by strengthening cooperation. The first introduction of quinoa began in Europe with jam plants coming from Chile and selected in Cambridge and then distributed to Denmark, the Netherlands, and other many countries. And as I said before, during the 90s, the Danish International Agency, Danida, and the International Potato Center, the SIP in Peru, have created the first global state of the art of quinoa based on multiple experimentation. But during the past 30 years, quinoa was tasted in all the continents, and nowadays quinoa is cultivated in more than 125 countries. Quinoa globalization entails challenges to the countries of origin, and these are important to consider for future development. Understanding this reality is fundamental to face the challenges of conserving local biodiversity, developing and promoting new varieties, and cooperating on plant genetic resources exchanges with inclusive processes toward fair benefit with Indian countries. The trends and limits for quinoa expansion are multiple, but I will briefly focus on three of them. The spread of worldwide quinoa is made from strong relationship between institutions that search at genetic material. Indian countries hold the largest jam plant collection, but many countries have established collection prior to the signature of the Commission Biological Diversity. Sorry. So today, quinoa, for today for quinoa, there is no single existing, existing legal framework providing a compressing coverage of all the issue related to the genetic resources and their sustainable management. Considering the challenging for protecting farmer rights and the variety, and at that time facilitating access to genetic resources for creating new biodiversity, new ways of doing science are needed. As we have seen, the number of research centers on quinoa is increasing worldwide. Although today the main concerned countries of the researches and study are still the first producers of quinoa. But as we can see in the map, there is a big gap in the knowledge on Africa, for example. This could be one of the challenges for us if we want to increase the chances of its introduction and development there. Some knowledge and technologies are already available, but there is an important imbalance technology access between North and South, and we need to think about that if we want to develop new collaboration at global level. Given that quinoa cultivation and research is expanding to parts of the world that are not familiar with the crop, researchers and farmers would benefit from being included in a global network with people facing similar challenges. Promoting cooperation and collaboration is the best option if we truly wish to promote quinoa with a global agroecological shift that considers agricultural biodiversity in all its dimension for food nutrition and sustainable agricultural system. No, I will quickly illustrate my research with four contrasting examples. The first on participatory plant breeding, the second on biodiversity diversification in cropping system, the third one on crop-wide relatives, and the fourth on adaptation to new environment. In Chile, as we can see with this graph, the genetic distance between the accession is very important in the central and southern Chile across accession from the northern part. The genetic diversity of the Laurent crops is higher of genetic diversity from the salar ecotype from the north of Chile, even if we have very few farmers cultivating quinoa in the central part of Chile. But that was not really considered until recently, and it was not perceived by farmer. It is why I developed my research mostly in this region. Indeed, 
it is easier to appreciate the genetic diversity when it is associated to phenotypic attributes that change from north to the south as the shapes of the panicles. All the farmers consider that they have only one white variety of quinoa in the central region. So the number of accession from this region for the quinoa collection in the natural gene bank was very reduced. This is why we try to develop new compression of this diversity with farmers, with uh, field travels, with field works. The information provided by farmers during survey led us to the analysis of agricultural practices from the sowing period to harvest, thus validating the hypothesis of the existence of several selection genotypes by isolated group of farmers in the central area of Chile. Here we have three examples of municipalities with different behaviors considering the agricultural practices on quinoa. In red, we have the sowing period, and in purple, the harvesting period. And we analyze the concentration and the distribution of these activities along month. And we consider as hypothesis that some genotypes show sensibility to photoperiodicities. For assessing this hypothesis of the sensibility to photoperiodicism, we made a collection of 18 genotypes for testing and comparing them in four agroecological zones with farmers. The experimentation was conducted in real condition, considered farmers' practices, and we use the fields, their field, as a diversity showcase for farmers' visits during the crop cycle in order to show them this genetic diversity. Among the 18 genotypes, three presented very high sensibility to photoperiod, and only five don't have any sensibility to the photoperiod. And what is important to consider, it was important to discuss with all partners what does it matter to farmers considering the temperature near the Pacific Ocean or in the interiors of the country with the mountains and the difference from the north to the south of the central region. And we consider all this result, this shared representation of local diversity on quinoa as an entry point for beginning our participatory plant building program. My second example is about agroecology using biodiversity. During an experimentation in the northern part of Santiago in Chile with uh, the CESA institution, we tried to design a new cropping system. And our objective was to design new cropping system using new association of plants with wild and cultivated species for reducing salinity stress on quinoa crop. And what we consider in the environment, some species of the desert present very high adaptation to drought and to very high concentration of salt, like Mesembryontenum crystallinum. And what we do in our methodology, we associate these two species and we mix greenhouse experimentation, field trios, and vitro tests, in vitro tests. Here is just a photography of this experiment, but the most important result is this one. Results show that under harried conditions, quinoa yields improve by 42% when cultivated with Mesembryontinum crystallinum than when grown without this invasive plant. This protection is given by less evaporation from soil and by a desalinization occurring in soil. In fact, salinity in soil with Mesembryontinum crystallinum was reduced by 58% as measured by electric conductivity due to the good site extraction capacity of this second species. So, under harsh conditions, enemies can, be, can become friends. Here is my third example. Considering quinoa as 
Biodiversity, during our FO project, we assessed adaptation and performance of quinoa through multiple experiments at international level. So we considered trials location in 10 countries and with a total of 28 study sheets. And we used a collection of 20 white genotypes for our trials during two years. And what we observed in her result, very large differences in seed yield were observed among the tested genotypes in the different countries. And if global research showed that quinoa could be adapted to many environments with higher yields as in Peru and Bolivia, it is not the case everywhere. And the main problem were seed quality, soil preparation, and hot temperature during the flowering stage. This figure shows the average of the standard deviation for each variety across the location. The accession exhibited huge variation in seed yield data. Considering the high standard deviation observed for each variety, it cannot be concluded that these varieties have a similar performance across the location, and we cannot find a single variety with high adaptation across all the sites. And the high variance of grain yeast per hectare guide us about the importance to consider more the geographical context of each study seed to assess quinoa adaptation. My last example is about the distribution of seven quinoa crop relatives in Peru. It was a research project conducted with my PhD student, Francesca Fagandini. We used the participatory mapping methodology with local community with associated with ethnobotanical survey. And we work in six villages in the main region of quinoa biodiversity in Peru at the west of the Lake Titicaca. Here you have an illustration of the process we participatory mapping with the actors, JS validation and collective restitution and validation with stakeholders for accessing the presence or absence of crop relative in each pixel of our maps. The conclusion of this research and the most important thing was that the, all the seven species studied were perceived both outside and inside the cultivated space. And it is very important for considering the conservation in situ and on farm management for protecting this crop rights relative to consider the two compartments outside and inside the cultivated space. However, some species were mainly perceived inside the cultivated quinoa plots. And this group of crop rights relative species correspond to those that the villagers, the farmers classified as model species and can be intercrossed with cleaner crop. So this local knowledge is very essential for us. It's crucial for going forward, for using genes from crop priority for creating hybrids with quinoa species. In conclusion, drought resistance, salinity tolerance, and exceptional nutrition value are some of the advantages of quinoa to face the effect of climate change in agriculture but access to genetic resources is necessary to allow the adaptation of an exhaustive species in new environment. And research play a central role in the development of quinoa through international collaboration. And adaptation of quinoa by local population from the beginning of the project is essential for producing it in a sustainable way. Here you can find the state of the art of the quinoa developed during the International Year of Quinoa. I will I share with you also some uh, example of my article and uh, thanks for your attention. Excellent, thank you very much Didier. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a, a fascinating uh, jog through quinoa and the importance of diversity in its uh, cultivation. Um, I've got lots of questions, but we already have a question in the chat box. So uh, let's see who we have here. We have Bulo de Beza. Do you want to speak to your 
Do you want to speak to your question or are you happy for me to talk? Bulo? Do you want to turn on your camera and microphone or do you want me to do it? Come on, you can do it. <laughs> <coughs> Bulo? No. Okay. All right. So Bulo has written a, a question here. I'm going to read it. It says, in my country... Oh, hello, Bulo? No? No. no? Okay. In my country, quinoa is considered as a weed species. As long as it has a high nutritional value, how do you think that to promote and expand the importance of this plant across the African countries? Oh, yes. Okay. So... I don't know which country you come from, Bulo, but um, yes, from somewhere, I guess, in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, okay. You, I think you can answer this at any rate, even if we don't exactly know where in Africa Bulo was referring to Didier. Just the principle yes, uh, of a weed but, versus a useful crop. But I think uh, if you consider quinoa a weed in your country, Probably it is not Cenobodium quinoa, but uh, ah. another species of the same genus. And probably Cenobodium album or other related uh, species in the same genus. And uh, what is important uh, to consider if you want to promote quinoa for food security in Africa, we need to work with uh, farmers, with the different families to develop some specific dishes for introducing and uh, developing some specific uh, plates for the local population. We did that in uh, one project in Bhutan, in Asia, from the beginning. And uh, during one year, before testing quinoa adaptation in different environments, we work with a different local community for testing quinoa and developing some specific dishes and uh, promoting these dishes before adapting quinoa in agricultural system. And yeah. it was really a good option for the appropriation of the crops in the cropping system after. Yes, so you have to make sure you have a market. It's, it's already well to grow a plant, but if there's nobody going to buy it, then it becomes a weed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right, that's great, thank you. Um, I just want to pick you up on the observation. You passed by the slide very quickly, but you said that the panicle shape changes from the north to the south in Chile. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, can you just revisit that and just describe to us, you know, in a few seconds, what that panicle shape change was and what the adaptive advantage of it might be? Okay, I can share again my screen and we can go to this uh, slide. There you are. Yeah. Yes, this one. Yeah. As you can see, in the north part of Chile, the panicles are more compact and the south are more open. And the one explanation we have, it is uh, similar to sorghum in different regions when the moisture is different because yeah. the climate in the northern part is tropical arid and in the southern part of Chile, we have more, more or less two hundred uh, to thousand millimeter precipitation so at the at the end of the cycle of the crop we have uh, the problem of moisture to go to the uh, the harvest yeah yeah okay okay and good the, with the wind it is a good element for eliminating this moisture if the panicle is the open. panicle is open yeah. yeah that makes sense so then there must be benefits of being compact yes so what are the so you've given the benefits of being open in the south, but what are the benefits of being compact in the north? Being compact in the north is protected yeah. the quinoa from the birds, and uh, being uh, open in the south, it is a necessary need for eliminating for the drying out water okay. with uh, wine. 
So you think compactness is, is beneficial for bird to protect the seeds against bird predation? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I'm not sure I would have Because they that. don't have many possibility for staying on the panicles. Yes. Well, it's harder to peck inside. So you can right. sacrifice the seed on the outside of the panicle and protect the ones on the inside. Okay. All right. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, I think what we'll do, thank you very much, Didier. I, I have some more questions, but we'll come back to maybe them later. Let's, mm -hmm. let's let um, Elodie rip and uh, she can give some very nice complimentary research now. Bring up your screen and um, Elodie's going to talk to us about some of her genomic studies in, um, in quinoa. Now, Elodie is a... Um, is a, a researcher in, in genomics and genetics. She did her PhD um, in the Czech Republic. Um, at, uh, I'm not going to try to say, the University Palaki of Palatsky, uh, of Olomouc in the Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, she, uh, and looking at chromosomes in wheat. Uh, and she's now been here in Kaust since 2018. She's been here for over three years now, um, just a little bit over three years, uh, where she's been working on the pan genome of quinoa, been improving the uh, reference genome of quinoa, building on the work of David Jarvis and others in the um, in the group. And uh, she's also she's also working on a. Um, on a new project now about heat stress tolerance. So with no further ado, it's great, very great pleasure to um, uh, give the floor to Elodie. Thanks a lot, Elodie. Go ahead. All right. So you're seeing my screen? Yes, I've got your screen. Good, and you're hearing me well. I can hear, well, I can hear you because I'm sitting in the same room as you. All right, so thank you, Mark, and thank you, Didier. Uh, I think before to start, I have just to uh, remind people from the CDA that um, there is another talk coming next week on Fonio. And um, starting from March, we have a seminar series on ancient DNA. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm moving on with... Um, up, so uh, presenting you a little bit of what we are doing uh, at Gauss in the Salt Lab uh, in terms of quinoa research. Um, so where we also try to contribute to the expansion of uh, quinoa in the world through genomics and phenotyping for the genetic, genetic improvement of quinoa. Um, so um, Didier has introduced the, the crop very well. I will just add up a little bit that um, this is a decotyledonous plant that despite having many purposes is mostly grown uh, for its seeds that we eat as a grain. Um, it's important for us to know in genomics that it belongs to the Amaranthaceae family together with, with other uh, major crops such as sugar beet and spinach from which we have genomic resources. And uh, like the other members of this family, quinoa is a halophyte plant. Um, so um, quinoa is a allotetraploid species um, that resulted from the hybridization from uh, ancestral A and B genome species. This happened likely in North America and gave rise to uh, an important species forest that is Kenopodium berlangeri that eventually migrated to the south uh, of America and um, gave rise to Kenopodium hercinum, another important uh, species forest because that's from hercinum that quinoa has been domesticated some uh, 7,000 years ago. Uh, the domestication history of quinoa is not very clear. Um, we know there are two main germplasm, the lowland and the highland, and the main center of genetic diversity is found in the highland uh, around Lake Triticaca. Um, and the reasons why it's uh, not very certain whether quinoa was domesticated in one or two events, possibly more, uh, is because uh, quinoa is grown in certain regions in sympathy with the wives. 
uh, which I thought happened mostly uh, in the lowland uh, uh, gem plasm, but today I learned that uh, the wilds can be grown also uh, um, in sepatry with cultivated quinoa in Peru. <laughs> so, mm. so that's uh, that's a very interesting fact. Um, then Didier has uh, introduced you to the importance of quinoa as a highly nutritious uh, food source that, um, thanks to uh, several thousand years of uh, evolution, domestication, and cultivation in the Andes has developed extremely good component for being grown in harsh environments. Uh, so we classified uh, the, the, um, the diversity of quinoa uh, in two germplasm, highland, lowland, and then uh, there is a pretty old but uh, seems to be robust classification in five ecotypes based on loose morphological traits um, in combination with the areas of cultivation. So valley, highland, salares, subtropical, and sea level. Now, um, this maybe even more than the intrinsic uh, nutritional capacity of quinoa is, uh, is uh, an extremely good point for um, the expansion of quinoa beyond the Andes because we will have to take into this uh, genetic diversity to uh, contribute to maybe the biggest mutation of quinoa as a crop to become, uh, which is to improve this, uh, this plant to a completely new uh, range of environment, climates, and agronomical practices. So that's where we think we can contribute. Uh, we don't have the long history of research that uh, DDA owns uh, in quinoa crops, certainly. Um, but we have uh, developed a strong background in phenotyping, quinoa uh, uh, in, in different environments and also uh, producing genomic resources and knowledge that can help uh, fasten the genetic improvement of quinoa. So the history of quinoa in our team started prior my time. Um, it has been the production of the first reference genome uh, of quinoa that was for a coastal cultivar, QQ74, that was published in Nature and was an extremely important uh, key to uh, um, agronomical development of quinoa because it has also helped um, um, mapping several genes uh, relevant to flowering time and also for uh, saponin content in the seed, which is a major mm. uh, um, um, hurdle to, to the consumption of quinoa. Now, uh, recently, we have produced an improved version of, uh, of this assembly uh, mm -hmm. that is already publicly available. Um, the major improvement is in terms of contiguity. So we have assembled more of the genome into the, the pseudomolecules and in terms of chromosome structure, because for quinoa, as for all these novel crops, genomics comes slightly before strong genetic support. And so there were some abnormalities uh, in the previous version uh, in terms of chromosome length uh, and, and structure, functional structure that uh, indicated us that we could do better. So, so mm. we have achieved that. And now this reference is the new support for all our diversity and genome evolution studies, uh, which are um, um, now um, the resequencing of the ex situ um, collection that we have uh, available. So we have resequenced um, about nearly 1,000 quinoa accessions. Uh, which definitely doesn't cover the genetic diversity of quinoa as a germplasm if we were to include what we have in South America, and is definitely different than what we have in our lab. Um, we here at CAUS have the facility, uh, the, the, the informatic facility to, to perform the genotyping of this accession through the mapping against the reference, and we have identified um, nearly four, uh, 40 million SNPs and 20 million indels that we distribute to all our collaborators performing genetic uh, studies. But for us, the main point is to use this resource um, uh, in collaboration with the team of Karschmidt in Uhenheim for characteri characterization of the population uh, genetics of this uh, germplasm. So these are preliminary results um, that were produced by Katarina, the postdoc there. Um, and she showed that um, those thousand accession are split into six main uh, ancestral population, but group I will say at this stage, because there is one main cluster that represents the lowland quinoa. Then we have the highland uh, uh, split it into four smaller cluster and uh, the middle um, 
six cluster is an, an admixture between the highland and the lowland, uh, the highland, sorry, and the lowland gem plasms. So um, this is pretty interesting because we always, in the genetic studies, there, there never been that, uh, that scale of resequencing. We always had small studies dif uh, studying different ecotypes mostly. Uh, so this is the first time we see the broad picture. Um, and um, we aim to first investigate the level of redundancy between the two main uh, gene banks, which are IPK and USDA, from which uh, the new hundred uh, and so countries can can take seeds from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we aim to ask questions such as what are the evolutionary and domestication events that has shaped the current quinoa genetic diversity. So this is meant to really inform uh, um, then later on with the markers that will define the different groups and uh, uh, fasten the work of breeding for um, quinoa adaptation to different environments. Uh, now, understanding that with one reference genome that is placing basically here, we cannot cover the integrity of the genetic diversity that is extremely wide in Kidoa. So we've taken a recent uh, opportunity a year ago to, to get funding from our center and the salt lab to produce eight more Kinoa reference genomes. Uh, so these have been selected through both genomic information. We selected, we had purist approach. We selected pure lines representing each of the ancestral populations from the population structure. And among those, we picked up those that perform well in our target environment, which is Middle East conditions, short days, and hot environments, uh, which we think um, are, is profitable to, to, to most harsh environments to, to where we aim to grow quinoa. Um, so we used cast resources for the sequencing. We also collaborated with the uh, French institution in RACI and RGV for the um, production of bio-nano optical maps that help us to now uh, obtain uh, eight near chromosome scale uh, um, reference assemblies, genome assemblies. Uh, so we have one that is chromosome scales and the others have uh, one or two chromosomes that break at the centromere. So that's extremely good results. I will spare you the statistics on the assembly not to lose half of the audience. <laughs> And um, I'm just going to show you, we, we received the data last week. So this is just a quick overview of what we aim to do with these novel resources. Um, here is an illustration of an important chromosome uh, for quinoa structure and diversity. This is chromosome CQ3B, which we have shown uh, with the uh, new reference to possess um, a large pericentromeric inversion um, that is present only in few accessions from the lowland germplasm, including our uh, former reference genome. And the issue with that is that when we investigate the resequencing uh, data, uh, we find that this uh, inversion uh, contributes to only a few of the lowlands and cluster together in the phylogeny. So we think this impedes um, uh, the transfer of beneficial traits and recombination. This, this is eventually a driving force to drift between uh, lowland populations. And we can see now that there are even other events happening on the same chromosome in the highlands. So um, this is to show you a little bit what we will be able to approach uh, uh, with these new resources in terms of what are the mechanisms that are driving the genetic diversity and structure of quinoa germplasm. We aim to further annotate those eight uh, genome references and use them together with our resequencing effort to perform a pangenome analysis for, for quinoa species uh, in order to identify the set of genes that are relevant for or contributing to the adaptation of quinoa to those different environments and climate. Um, now I'm going to switch to the other level of information that will come together at some point, which is the quinoa phenotyping in our team. So um, this has been led mostly by Mark, Gabby, Clara, and Gordon over several years, where um, they have grown um, up to 1,300 lines of quinoa in different environments, mostly uh, in Australia and China, as well as other countries, with the aim to phenotype 12 architect uh, architectural and yield traits um, to define the best ideotypes for those different locations and environments um, that uh, relating to domestication. So this has been um, 
we also have additional phenotypes provided by uh, drone image analysis that contributes to the how um, well the plant is performing in the environment. But recognizing that, uh, of course, not everyone can grow uh, up to 1,000 uh, ac um, kino accession in, in mm -hmm. its field, we also have um, produced um, some diversity panels, so a selection of 400 or 140 accessions that maximize, at this stage, the phenotyping diversity, but we aim to also combine with the genomic data this, uh, the, these populations. And these are most broadly used uh, by our collaborators that perform genetic studies for the mapping of some important domestication traits, such as flowering time in Kiel, uh, still nutritional uh, quality in Washington State University, and uh, plant high um, in the different locations that is done by our PhD student, Clara. So along with this work, um, um, phenotyping cards have been uh, developed and has been a really great tool, not only for scoring the, the, the diversity and, uh, and uh, trying to, to structure it, but also to that helps us appreciate um, the quality of the field, the, the, the feed management, and how does it impact on the phenotypes so that we can later on uh, uh, use this phenotyping across different uh, environments, between different teams um, and years. And that came together as um, uh, a camp compendium of methodologies for quinoa phenotyping um, that was um, contributed by 27 authors from 10 different institutions, including CIRAD, which has been key in uh, um, translating this tool in the broader uh, community, quinoa community, both academics and breeders, to recognize the need to um, uh, find a consensus on our method to phenotype quinoa so that we can share later on uh, not only the germplasm, but the, 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 the pedigree in those different locations through a database that uh, Clara created. It's uh, within Germinate's infrastructure. So there is a Quinoa Germinate database now when everybody can share uh, their, um, their phenotyping information. Uh, now, just uh, a few words uh, that is not my work. This is the work of Clara. Um, was how she makes use of both phenotype and genotype to um, map domestication traits. She, um, she is currently in the field even today, actually, where you can see this is, a, this is the plant she's phenotyping in, um, in Saudi Arabia. She has um, grown a set of accessions in uh, four different locations across two or three years, and she's combining phenotyping and genotyping in genome-wide association studies to uh, map the traits that uh, are the most urgent for domesticating quinoa. Uh, and she's doing this across different environments. Now, uh, I think the nice feedback of this work, uh, especially the, the phenotyping one, how it feeds the genomic, because we cannot answer all questions with just uh, genomics and genetics, is uh, we observe the plasticity uh, uh, of quinoa in different fields and environments. And this we don't obviously want to do uh, with quinoa what we have done with the other crop. We don't want one variety that uh, performs well everywhere. We want to best make uh, a use of the diversity. But for this, we really need to understand um, the genetic and molecular basis of this phenotyping plasticity so that we can predict uh, the value of each accession in the different environments. And um, at the moment, we have the structure provided by the, the, the genotype and genetic studies, but we don't know how well they match with the different ecotypes that are morphologically uh, defined. And actually, so far, no genetic studies has proved that. So um, this is still a pending question. Um, and I think this is, this is coming together nicely this year. Um, now, this brings us to the last topic. Uh, very briefly, uh, quinoa is uh, such a great crop, uh, such a huge potential. It nearly has it all. Um, it is uh, uh, highly nutritious and um, uh, tolerant to many stress, including drought, soil tolerance, and frost. So, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's um, uh, not coping well with high temperatures. Um, it sustains a wide range of temperatures from minus eight to 35 degrees but at different developmental stages. But what matters for us is the grain. And unfortunately, uh, quinoa is heat sensitive at reproductive stages. Uh, actually, the 99% quinoa that is grown in the world in Bolivia and Peru, that what you have in your meal, 
become sterile uh, when temperature reaches above 30 degrees. So we have an urge uh, for improving that if we really mean to grow quinoa in marginal lands in the context of climate change. So with that in mind, um, we took um, the, the, the um, strategy to exploit not just quinoa diversity, but the wide diversity of quinoa, meaning taping into the wild relative genetic diversity, because they cross steadily with quinoa, and they actually uh, uh, are from much harsher um, um, niches environment in both um, North and South America by several degrees of magnitude. Actually, there is like they grow in in uh, environments that are ten degrees higher uh, than than quinoa. Uh, so we think we can, by uh, studying those two species uh, in hot environment, we, uh, we eventually uh, will uncover mechanisms of the adaptation to high temperature that are not present in cultivated quinoa, but can be transferred in this, um, in this background. So we built a project and a team uh, to tackle this issue, a uh, very international team. Uh, where we aim to, where the novelty is exploiting the wild genetic diversity. Um, and what no one else has been done uh, in quinoa research for, for heat stress is to address heat stress as a very specific phenological um, uh, scale. We aim to target very deep with large omics uh, data. So um, we actually got funded for that for three years at KAUST. Um, and uh, we are currently finishing the first um, um, experiment. So this is very preliminary results because we are still in the mm -hmm. process of harvesting. Um, but we have grown the largest panel of diversity in semi-control conditions, uh, meaning in uh, our high-tech greenhouses here at KAUST, mm -hmm. uh, where we are able to grow our plants in control conditions and transfer them in the second room to, uh, to subject them to heat stress during uh, reproductive stage specifically because we cannot synchronize flowering in quinoa nor in the wilds. Um, and uh, during these conditions, we are recording morphological, physiological uh, uh, parameters that allows us to appreciate the uh, range of responses to heat stress, um, both in well watered and suboptimum watered conditions, because we don't want to improve uh, quinoa heat stress tolerance at the cost of um, a plant that will be less drought tolerant. Um, and um, uh, that, that's very important because if you see, just as an example, uh, uh, the first, um, the, the most heat stress tolerant ex uh, expected the quinoa accession that we, we can find is our reference genome QQ74 the, that is from Chile. Mm -hmm. But this one is also originating from an environment that uh, has mm -hmm. a lot, a, a large annual precipitations. And uh, that might not be the one that performed the best under drought stress, uh, heat by dry conditions. So here I just show you uh, ordered as are the different geno genotypes that we managed to harvest in time. So here is, um, is a bell and dairy accession and uh, four different quinoa accessions, all ordered by the um, expected gradient of heat stress tolerance based on the temperature in um, environment of origin. And we can see at this stage only trends uh, on the effect of heat stress on the panicle dried weight uh, where we can see control seven day in the heat stress well water seven day in heat stress uh, water deficient and 10 days uh, in heat stress well watered um, and actually you can see that heat stress is having um, a more dramatic effect on the on the production of seeds on the suspected heat sensitive compared to the suspected heat tolerance so at this stage this is just validating our uh, our hypothesis on how to select among the genetic diversity for this trait later on um, we are going to uh, study the impact on yield because this is our target and here is just an example from our um, past experiment providing preliminary results of the effect of heat stress on a sensitive quinoa that dramatically reduces the size of the seeds, as well as the yield in terms of uh, um, amount of seeds, total uh, amount of seeds, while the wilds here is uh, hercinum seeds are absolutely not uh, affected by the same treatment that was 38 degrees Celsius. 
So just to say that together with these uh, projects, we are generating um, a new bunch of genomic resources, especially for the wild, and that will also complement um, uh, the domestication history. We are meeting two aims here. So that's coming together in the next three years. I'd like to thank, uh, of course, uh, my team, uh, who, which is not all working on quinoa, but a very nice bunch of people. Um, I'd like to thank the core lab uh, from KAUST, uh, both supercomputing, bioscience, but very much lately, the plant growth core lab facility for accommodating our needs and being extremely responsive and allowing this work to, to, to be performed here, uh, as well as all our many collaborators, both in genomics and uh, genetics and phenotyping. And uh, of course, Max, for, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. And that's it. Oh, that's, that's perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Yabadi. And uh, actually, perfect timing as well. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> All right. That's super. So are there any questions from the audience? There's nothing in the chat box yet. I just um, want to check with you, Elodie, just you were watering to wait we, for the well-watered and the water-limited plants. And you're watering to wait like daily or um, was it... Uh, less often than that. So this time we have uh, heated um, quinoa and the wilds up to 40 degrees. Yes. Uh, and we've watered, we've maintained a potential by watering three times a day in yeah. the heat okay. room. Three okay. times a day? Absolutely. And in control conditions, we will need to water only once a day or every two days. Wow. But that's to yeah. ensure that we are not, okay. we are we're just treating both. Yeah um heat and drought stress absolutely no it's very very good it's very good um practice to do that good okay are there other other questions or comments thank you bulo insightful presentation yes <laughs> i think you did well if i can it would be, i have a just a Didier, comment you're on, your presentation you're on or i can hear you ah i know why yes. sorry I had my sound off. <laughs> Just one comment to your presentation, Elodie. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. And I want to come back to when phenotyping meeting genotype. Yes. And it is very interesting for me for considering the relation between uh, genotype and environments. But I think we need to consider all the aspects and in particular societies and the agricultural practices. And if we go to the human issue and human aspect of practices, I think we can uh, enrich your relation between uh, genotypes and environment. And I think it is crucial if you want to understand, especially the, the region where the island ecotypes can meet the coastal ecotype, because we have some specificity in uh, Indian communities in the history of Chile with the Diakita in the north of Santiago, very specific with very specific quinoa, and they are different and they are intermediary between uh, lowland ecotypes and islands. And perhaps we can have uh, one explication of uh, the diversification with the possibility of cross between two ecotypes in this uh, community. You are mute, Elodie. Well, I'm mute. Okay, go. You okay. speak again. No, I'm unmuted. You you stay muted. Okay. Yes, go on. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to say that uh, your comment is very welcome, as well as your help, if you're willing to, because we, <laughs> we're actually lacking uh, um, this, and we know it. Um, and uh, we, we are seeking for collaborations uh, to, to answer those questions. Um, so, so yeah, um, I will certainly be in touch uh, after this talk uh, with you. Yes. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking. Do you have a specific example, Didier, of where bringing in that human domain? I mean, okay, the intermediate is very interesting, without a doubt. But I was thinking more broadly, where some of the human uh, requirements or demands are going to be useful in this type of study. Do you have a specific example? Maybe I'm just being a bit thick here. 
but uh, <coughs> for that and about the possibility for intercrossing with uh, white ratil and uh, with the uh, work we developed in Peru. And it, is it was very interesting to discuss with Carl Schmidt and uh, Angel Murica about their experimentation in uh, agricultural station for crossing the different species and what we can observe with uh, local community and in their fields uh, because people can recognize the hybrids in their field and they know the parents of each hybrid. So it is very interesting to discuss deeply with the farmer. And in the, south, sure. in the central part of Chile, it is the same. We have Kenopodium hircinum in the field and Kenopodium quinoa cultivated. And when they can observe hybrids from the two species, farmers can cut the hybrids and uh, giving them to their sheep. Oh, really? Before the maturity of the crop, yes, of the plants. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Actually, um, I was in northern Saudi Arabia just um, a few weeks ago, and they were showing me, um, I was actually with Garby, and they're showing uh, some fields of wheat uh, that were growing early in the season, and they had the sheep on the fields. They were deliberately grazing the wheat for the first um, month or two of the growth, and then they'd take the sheep off and let the wheat kick off. But it is a good weed and with high protein content. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, I should also say that uh, with with um, LED's discovery of this large inversion in QQ seventy four, uh, I just have to despair of myself because <laughs> I chose that ecotype for the high uh, resolution de novo sequencing all those years ago because I thought it was an interesting plant coming from a warmer place and lowland and I was doing it because of the keeping an eye on actually now what LED is doing with bringing heat tolerance in but it's a it turns out I think it was a spectacularly bad decision by me <laughs> given it's got this very large pericentromeric inversion. It can still recombine. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. where it can still recombine? Yeah. Okay, all right. But for a reference genome, it's, <laughs> I'm glad that uh, LED is doing seven more uh, de novo high quality sequences. So we can get this peri, this pan genome, I think is gonna be very important and tidy up some of these analyses. Well, thanks, LED. Okay, that was very good. Are there any other questions or comments anybody would like to make? We're just a couple of minutes over and I'm very sensitive that uh, Didier has a meeting right now uh, at the FAO. So I think we should probably uh, thank everybody. Ah, do we, Christoph Glasman. Yeah, yeah, I, w I just wanted to join the others in saying that I really love the presentation, greatly appreciated. It, it's, uh, it's fantastic to work on Kinoa these days. Um, I have one very specific small question. Uh, it's about the eigenvalues of the of the multivariate analysis uh, of the molecular diversity. Uh, I just wonder the extent to which axis two is important, and does it relate to any geographic uh, climb? Well, I don't know that. I don't understand. So this is your genetic diversity, or was this from? No, no, the, the um, population structure, right? From your population structure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'm sorry, I can I can reply for that. Mm. Um, this is very preliminary because we are um, downsizing the set uh, by removing duplicates. So this might change uh, a bit the picture. Mm. Um, and we haven't matched yet uh, this information with the, the climatic data or um, eco environment. Uh, so we don't know exactly yet <laughs> um how okay. much will represent so you don't know what the primary determinants are for those two axes and what the relative contributions to variation no. are yet no. okay okay we'll have to hold on christoph but it's, a, it's actually a very good question yeah, yeah absolutely um and when you finish tidying your data then you can start drilling in behind yes the determinants yeah yeah, yeah good thanks a lot for that question yeah. though <laughs> yeah. yes.
It's good. Yeah. yeah. All right then. Super. Good. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Didier, uh, for giving your uh, yeah really yeah. It was a perfect pair of talks, actually. I think it really does capture sort of paraphrase my nation of the the picture drawing in all sorts of social, geographical, and other aspects, right, and in the opposite direction coming in genomics. I think they're coming together pretty nicely now. Mm. So I look forward to that collaboration with Sirad developing more. So thank you all very much, and can you join me in thanking both the speakers for their excellent presentations. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And see you next week. <laughs> see you all next week. Next week for next uh, presentation. That's right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Didier. Bye, everybody. Good.